At this time, Ed Heinsohn is going to come speak, and you know, Ed is a very accomplished speaker. In fact, he's one of the best preachers in America, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, didn't you win some preaching contest when you were like 16 or something? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was told by a friend of his uh, that he was this quiet little guy, and they put him up there to preach, and all of a sudden, bah, you know, he won the preaching contest. How many of y'all have ever been involved in a preaching contest? Uh, but nevertheless, apparently uh, in the winter up in Mich- Detroit, Michigan, that, they did things like that up there back then. But uh, Dr. Heinsohn has three earned uh, PhDs. Uh, in, uh, he early on was uh, an Old Testament scholar. He still is. But he uh, wrote some important works and things like this. Uh, like um, Isaiah's Emmanuel, he wrote a book on the Philistines, uh, which is very interesting, uh, you know, about how they came from Greece. How does that relate to the Palestinians today? I don't know. But nevertheless, he's uh, a big wig at Liberty University, has been there for many years. I don't know his exact title, you know, it's, it's distinguished professor and all this kind of stuff. And he's also on The King is Coming. A, a television show out of Colton, California. So, Ed, come up here and uh, give us some rapture talk. Thank you very much. It's an honor to uh, have the privilege to speak to you tonight, uh, having uh, been at that first meeting in 1992 and remembering the challenge. Uh, the passion, uh, the concern uh, that was expressed. Hard to imagine uh, that it's been 20 years ago. Uh, for, and for all these years, uh, we want to thank you so very much for your uh, constant participation and uh, your continual involvement. Uh, the Pre-Trib Research Center is focused, obviously, on the pre-tribulational rapture that binds us uh, together. Uh, It is a broad organization uh, that includes everybody from Calvinists to Arminians, Presbyterians to Baptists, uh, people from the Calvary chapels and from the Free Grace churches. Uh, There is every kind of individual here from almost every kind of background imaginable but all of whom are committed uh, to the belief uh, that Jesus is coming back uh, for all of His church uh, prior to the tribulation period. Uh, It has been an organization in which questions have been raised, issues have been uh, defined, insights have been gained. Uh, We have been uh, helped, uh, humbled, horrified. Uh, by things that we've heard over the years, uh, challenge to rethink, redefine, uh, and uh, qualify uh, some of our opinions and our attitudes. Uh, and uh, books have been written, uh, articles, conferences. In fact, uh, since 1992, over 100 books uh, have been written by members of this organization, hundreds of articles, scores of conferences, and the message of the pre tribulational rapture. Uh, has been heralded, I think, more strongly and more clearly in the last 20 years uh, as a result of this organization. And uh, I want to take a moment tonight to thank all of you for your teaching, your preaching. Uh, This is a message that needs to be heralded in the pulpits, uh, in the press, uh, in the parlors, uh, and in our own personal lives. Uh, that we would live in anticipation of the fact that indeed uh, the Lord Jesus uh, is coming soon. Now, I'm not in charge of the sound, so I have no idea what's going on, Uh, but uh, we'll make that work. Uh, There have also been uh, differences of opinion along the way. Uh, Dr. LaHaye says that when the rapture occurs, all your clothes fall off. They're left behind in a nice, neat pile uh, to prove uh, that you've been raptured. I say, Tim, where do you get that from? Well, when Jesus rose from the dead, the burial shroud was left behind. Yeah, but when uh, Elijah went up, only the mantle fell off. And with Enoch, it sounds like everything disappeared. Uh, If all of your clothes fall off, what about your glasses? 
false teeth, artificial parts, fillings. Some of us would have more left behind than God. Now, there's Grandma. She left a pile. Uh, none of that was real. Uh, there are some things we won't know all the answers to uh, till we get to heaven. Uh, but the challenge uh, along the way uh, has been to uh, do more for the cause of Christ. And it's been a privilege to do that. Uh, there are many, many wonderful resources out here uh, in the lobby. I hope, uh, again, you'll take advantage of all of them. Uh, some of the newest things uh, that we've been able to put together, uh, we decided to get it down on the level of layman. Uh, Bible prophecy uh, from A to Z. Uh, let's just go through the alphabet. A for the Antichrist, B for the Blessed Hope, C for the conversion of the Jews. Teach people Bible prophecy from A to Z. Uh, we have it in a DVD in printed form. Uh, we also have a message where we go through the whole book of Revelation in one hour. You say, how do you do the whole book of Revelation in one hour? Fast, real fast. Uh, but you do it so you summarize what it's all about so the average person can understand it. Now, I teach Revelation at Liberty, 36 hours. The book of Daniel, 36 hours. After the fourth toe of the second horn of the third beast, they're all confused. Uh, so you put it all together so that the average person can understand it in a quick overview. And then our newest one, the prophetic promise from Genesis to Revelation. What is the theme of prophecy through the whole Bible all about? And we have all three of those available, I think, for $50. And then we've also taken some of the course material uh, that we taped on the King is Coming telecast. And because I teach at Liberty, they're willing to give credit for it as well. And so in addition to those three things, we have four courses. Uh, the foundation of biblical studies will take you from Genesis to Revelation. It qualifies for six hours of college credit at Liberty, fully accredited. You get a certificate studies from it. Uh, and then uh, we also have one in the foundation of Bible prophecy, uh, one in an advanced course, amazing prophecies, and then a detailed study uh, of the book of Revelation in about 20 lessons. And uh, those are $197 a piece, or you get them all for $588. And in each one, you get a certificate. And if you do all four, you get the diploma uh, in biblical studies from Liberty University. Fully accredited credit, 15 hours worth. If you took it at our university, it cost you about $7,000. Uh, so for 588, it's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, we let uh, family members, spouses take it for $25 in addition. Uh, you can do it as a Bible study group for that as well. Uh, they'll even take it on a payment plan out there. Liberty will work you a deal uh, on anything. God has wonderfully blessed that school over the years. We now have 13,000 students on campus uh, fully committed to biblical creationism, uh, to the pre-tribulational prophetic viewpoint, to personal salvation, to the inspiration and inerrancy of the Word of God. We have 500 faculty members on campus, and then we have about 80,000 students in distance learning programs uh, all over the world. Uh, it's a privilege to be part of a school uh, founded by a man who believed uh, that the message of the gospel needed to be proclaimed in this generation. I've been asked to talk to you tonight about the challenge of the pre-trib rapture for the 21st century. Uh, and I want to title this uh, Good News and Bad News. Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, a Christian magazine by the name of Christian Century, a very liberal magazine, announced that the 20th century would be the Christian century, hence the name of the magazine. Uh, they proposed in 1900 a post-millennial vision of the century that was to come, a century that they said would be the apex of Christianity and Christian influence in society that would ultimately bring in the kingdom of God. Well, I don't need to remind you the 20th century brought in the Depression. It brought in the greatest world wars the planet had ever seen. More people died in war in that century than in all of history combined. It was anything but what they proposed it would be. At the dawn of the 21st century, Christianity Today ran an article commenting on that and admitting only the premillennialists said 
you're going to have bad news before you ever have good news. Things will get worse before they ever get better. And whether you agree with the position or not, they suggested they were the only ones that got it right in the 20th century. As many of you know, I had serious heart surgery uh, almost four years ago. I nearly died several times. I spent a hundred days in the hospital uh, attempting to recover. Uh, And uh, as I finally got to consciousness, uh, the doctors would come in and sometimes they would say, well, we have good news and we have bad news. Uh, And uh, for a while I had a roommate uh, and he'd always say, well, give me the good news first. And then he'd end up with all the bad news. And I thought, that's not good. You don't want to do that. You got the order out of order. Uh, You don't want the bad news last. You want to get the bad news out of the way first. You heard about the guy that went to the doctor? The doctor examined him and said, man, after testing you, I I need you to come back in a few days. He came back and the doctor said, "I've, I've got good news and I've got bad news. And the patient said, well, give me the good news first. And the doctor said, the good news is you're going to be dead in 24 hours. And the patient said, that's good news. What's the bad news? And the doctor said, I was supposed to tell you yesterday. Uh, you say, that's the bad news. So I want to start this morning, this evening, with the bad news. The bad news is we live in a fallen world, a world of challenges and difficulties and problems. The bad news is that we still live with the threat of global terrorism. It has not gone away in these last 10 years. On September uh, 11, in 2001, I was in California doing the first taping for the King is Coming telecast. Dave Brees was in the hospital at the point of death. They were looking for somebody to take over that telecast. And on that very day, 911 occurred. Uh, I remember God sensing to say to me, Ed, this is serious business. You need to be willing to do this. Well, in the 10 years that have passed since then, we are still living in a world of constant suicide and homicide bombers, of destabilization, uh, of over 17,000 terrorist attacks since 9-11. If you go on the website, religionofpeace.com, they follow every terrorist attack every single day worldwide. They tell you what happened, where it happened, and how many people lost their lives. Uh, Tim Lay and I, when we were writing the book, The Global Warning, uh, checked it back in about 2006, and it was at 7 thousand attacks at that point in time. Today, it's over 17,000 terrorist attacks all over the planet, in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, in the Middle East. Over 100,000 people have died in those attacks. It doesn't matter how many troops we put into the Middle East or take out of the Middle East. The problem will not go away. When you have a religion that authorizes the use of force to make a convert and the threat of death to keep a convert, you have, in essence, the world's largest cult. Uh, It may be a world religion by definition, but it's no different than Jim Jones or David Koresh. Uh, It is a religion that authorizes making the convert at the tip of the sword or the point of the gun, and the problem is not going to go away. It's part of the bad news of the day and age in which we live. Secondly, we live with the challenge of turmoil in the Middle East. I don't need to remind you of what is happening in what has been called by the press the Arab Spring, which is really nothing more uh, than the Muslim march to madness. Uh, It is uh, a turmoil that is destabilizing the Middle East today. If you picked up the newspaper this morning in the hotel, uh, you saw in the USA Today uh, the headline, Muslim Brotherhood wins the elections in Egypt. Over 60% of the vote. And yet when Bible prophecy teachers suggested 
early on several months ago that that's what all of this would lead to. We were looked upon as though we were politically incorrect, uh, that we were ignorant uh, of the great trends uh, that were happening uh, in the global society that were going to lead to the democratization of the Middle East. And I would remind us that we need to pray for people in the Middle East, for Christians who live in the Middle East, uh, for those that are caught behind the Islamic curtain, and for the Muslim people themselves who desperately need a breath of genuine freedom that they have never experienced. Uh, I don't need to remind this group that there's never been democracy in any of those countries. Back in 1979... When I was a young professor at Liberty in my 30s, I was invited to go to Africa with our missions team for a month. We traveled to what was then the country of Rhodesia. We were under military guard and we traveled from city to city in military convoys because the country was at war in a civil war. And the determination of the press in 1979 was we must see uh, the change of government uh, in Rhodesia, uh, that it must be turned into Zimbabwe. It must be turned over to the people themselves. And yet as we traveled from school to school, hospital to hospital, church to church, prison to prison, and preached the message of Christ, we were told by everybody in that country, black and white, if there is an election in this country, the dictators will take over. And the dictators will then subjugate everybody else, including the minority tribes in this country. And I don't need to remind you that a year later, Robert Mugabe was elected by democratic process as the president of Zimbabwe and has become the most hostile dictator in all of Africa. His country today is one of the poorest in Africa, yet he lives in the largest house on the African continent. Nobody in the press talks about this. It's politically incorrect to go there. Nobody mentions this. And yet the very same pattern is happening today in the Arab world. It is only a matter of time till we see the march that leads to the battle of Gog and Magog and ultimately the kind of crisis that the Bible reminds us will happen in the distant future. The third thing I see in bad news is the threat to Israel's future, uh, the challenge for a Palestinian state, the Iranian attempt to develop a nuclear program, Ahmadinejad coming to the United Nations saying, I am a man of peace, all I want is peace. A piece of this and a piece of that. A piece of everything. <laughs> Isaiah 62 verse 1 says, For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest till righteousness and salvation shines forth from that city. Yes, they have been regathered as the bones have been assembled according to Ezekiel's prophecy. Yes, we are awaiting the movement of the Spirit of God to bring about a national conversion in the future. But I would remind us, God is opening hearts and doors in Israel over and over again. There are more Messianic congregations than ever before. There is more truth being proclaimed than ever before. Last January, Tim Lahan and I went to Israel. Uh, we prayed for them for New Year's Eve and celebrated the New Year in Israel. Uh, and then we were invited to uh, speak and teach at the Israel College of the Bible in Netanya. 300 Israeli believers and Arabic believers. They prayed in Arabic. They prayed in Hebrew. They sang in Hebrew. They sang in Arabic. They translated our messages uh, in Hebrew, Arabic, and Russian. It was a wonderful thing to see uh, because they had been brought together in a common bond of salvation in the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, we must continue to love the people of Israel Pray for the people of Israel. Every time you go to Israel, God is using your presence to say to them, there are Christians in America that love you because of the message of Jesus Christ. But as many of the Jewish people will tell you, 
We're not used to being loved. Uh, go love somebody else. Uh, nobody loves us. Nobody likes us. It bothers us that you love us. Yes, it bothers them to the glory of God. Because God continues to convince people in Israel. I think of our guide that uh, led us on so many tours for so many years. Uh, who uh, was sympathetic to what we were all about. But not a believer. Who has now come to faith in Christ. Who's been publicly baptized and declared Jesus Christ as his Messiah. God is doing great things in Israel. But Israel needs our prayers. They need our encouragement. Uh, the indefensible borders are something that they cannot live with. And we must pray for the will of God and the purpose of God to be accomplished there in the years ahead. Fourthly, I would remind us that in these 20 years that we have been meeting of the whole trauma of moral disintegration in our society. Uh, the increased emphasis on the feminization of the message of the gospel. Uh, the homosexual uh, revolt in this country uh, to try to give us a Jesus of a different kind. A female Jesus, a gay Jesus, a married Jesus. I don't know how you do both gay and married, but uh, there he is. A bisexual Jesus, uh, uh, whatever. A Jesus who is the epitome uh, of a fallen culture and not the Jesus of the Word of God. Last summer, my wife and I were in England. Uh, on June the 15th, the headlines uh, in the British press uh, said uh, that the British Parliament has voted... To defend rapists' rights. The Prime Minister said, well, I don't agree with it, but the courts say it's a law, so that's the law. So we have to defend the rights of rapists. The year before, we were in Australia and New Zealand, uh, two countries that openly uh, legalized prostitution. The headlines in the Auckland Press uh, in New Zealand uh, was complimenting uh, a female television personality in that city because she had opened a brothel for women uh, so that ugly women could have a man. Uh, and uh, they were acknowledging this as such a wonderful step of morality and improvement. We are living in a day and time that is leading to accommodation, that leads to propagation, that leads to legalization, and ultimately the protection of evil and the discrimination against righteousness. We are living in very challenging times. Fifthly, we have the whole trivialization of religion that is going on uh, in the postmodern Christian movement today. Uh, that uh, sermons uh, have turned into nothing more uh, than somebody sharing their own personal journey uh, that they claim they are on in an attempt to try to discover the great mystery of God. Uh, gone is thus, saith the Lord. Gone is a clear declaration of the message of the Word of God. Now, I would remind us there have always been doctrines that needed to be defined, Issues to be debated, heresies to be confronted, truths to be defended, obstacles to be overcome. The church has had to deal with legalism, uh, Gnosticism, ritualism, liberalism. But in the rise of apostasy in our own times, it's coming from within our own ranks. It was one thing when liberals stood up at the end of the 19th century and the dawn of the 20th century and said the Bible is not uh, the inspired and errant Word of God. Uh, it is a fallible book written by uh, human beings with spiritual and religious intent. In other words, it's not true, but it warms our hearts. Uh, therefore, come to our church. Jesus is really not divine. He's not the Son of God. He didn't die for your sins. He didn't rise from the dead. And He's certainly not coming back again. Uh, but He warms our hearts. And there was a reaction against that kind of thing in which fundamental Bible-believing Christians said, we will not accept that. We will not tolerate that. If we have to leave your denomination, if we have to leave your institution, if we have to start all over again in the storefronts of America to proclaim the truth of the gospel, so be it. If we have to start brand new schools that are committed to the Word of God, then so be it. And after a hundred years... 
evangelicalism won. The liberal churches are in decline. The denominations merge constantly because they're losing numbers. Once you take the heart of evangelism away from the church, there is no reason for it to grow. Once you take away the message of the gospel, there's no reason to even attend. It didn't take over a hundred years for people to finally figure out if the Bible is not true, Jesus is not God, He didn't die for my sins, and He didn't rise from the dead, and He's not coming back again. Why are we wasting our time being here? Come on, Louise, let's go bowling. Uh, They're out of there. But the tragedy is, now that evangelicals have the largest churches in America. We have the largest broadcast organizations and ministries. We have the largest outreach of printing and publishing and the largest outreach of radio and television. The younger generation is suggesting that we not take the things of the Bible so seriously. I do not need to remind you of Rob Bell's book, Love Wins. A sense of the cosmic love of God that ultimately will win the world without sending people to hell. Well, I would remind us you do not win the world by watering down the message of the Bible. Uh, The testimony we heard tonight uh, from the Calvary chapels, they don't have all these first generation converts in their churches because they tiptoe around the message of the gospel. They're willing to go up to anybody, anywhere of any race of any type and tell them Jesus loves you, died for your sins, and you need to trust him as your savior or you're going to burn in hell. Uh, That message is very, very clear in their churches, whether you like their music or not. Uh, Uh, They teach the Bible. They proclaim the message. You cannot bend justice to the point of injustice in the name of love. Rob suggests that everybody will go to heaven. Really? Then why did Jesus say broad is the way that leads to destruction? Narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there be that find it. But Rob says, well, I got upset by pictures I've seen. He's always reacting to a picture in his books. And some of you are thinking, I don't even know who Rob Bell is. He is the most influential young preacher in this country. His church has over 6,000 people attending it every Sunday in Grand Rapids. His books have been reprinted 30 and 40 times. He has almost a million books in print. He is the favorite theologian, and he's not a theologian, of young preachers. He is read by more young pastors than anybody in this country. He wrote the book, The Velvet Elvis, in which he said the church has become like an obscure Velvet Elvis picture, a throwback from another generation that does not understand the times in which we live. In his new book, Love Wins, The Fate of Every Person That Ever Lived, He says, the more I live life, I cannot believe that if you don't believe in Jesus, you won't go to heaven. My life experience, he says, as a pastor, tell me that there must be some people who are going to heaven who do not trust Jesus as their Savior. You don't build your theology on your life experiences. Any one of us that have ever pastored a church have been asked tough questions by people going through difficult circumstances and personal tragedies in their life. And unless your theology is anchored to the Word of God, you won't have the right answer. Rob says, well, there was a picture hanging in my grandparents' home. He comes from a long line of Christians. Uh, His father is a very well-known Christian leader in the state of Michigan, uh, a federal judge. Uh, His grandparents were believers. They had a picture in their house uh, of a chasm uh, uh, across the flames of hell uh, and a cross across that chasm. And there were people walking across the cross going into heaven. Uh, As a kid, I saw that picture in my grandparents' house and it scared the daylights out of me. Typical spoiled brat third generation Christian. I grew up in a truck driver's home. My dad dropped out of school in the eighth grade. Uh, My mother never even went to high school. My parents never read a book in their life. Uh, I got saved in vacation Bible school because somebody told me Jesus loved me, died for my sins, and I could go to heaven and get out of hell. I saw the same picture when I was a kid, and I thought... Wonderful! Great! 
Thank God somebody gets to go to heaven. Ah, that's the best thing I've ever seen. You bring your own perspective to what you look at in life. You interpret every experience by your own viewpoint in life. And when you come with a viewpoint of faith, you end up with a response of faith as well. On page 155 in his book, Rob says, Jesus declares that he's saving everybody. There are endless possibilities to this. In a television interview, he suggested even the devil one day may repent. Really? He's had a several thousand years to think about it. It hasn't happened yet. He's going to spend a thousand years in the abyss, and it's still not going to work. And he's in the lake of fire forever. Uh, no, I don't think the devil's ever going to repent, Rob. I'm sorry. He said, well, you know, there are people that encounter the grace and peace and love and forgiveness of Jesus who don't even... We need to widen the scope of Christianity. Let everybody in. More than incipient universalism, 19th century liberal sentimentalism, second chance Protestant purgatory, Schleiermacher replackage for the 21st century. Open heaven to everybody. The Muslims, the Buddhists, the Hindus, Judas... Nero, Hitler, Stalin, the guys that blew up the World Trade Center. But Rob says, yeah, but what about somebody's grandmother who wasn't a Christian? And they got saved and they came to me and said, well, what about grandma? Can't we let grandma into heaven? And the answer is, if she is unsaved, unconverted, and unredeemed, no. Because if you let unsaved grandma into heaven, guess what? It isn't heaven anymore. You let Stalin in, he'll kill the Christians. You let Hitler in, he'll kill the Jews. You let Nero in, he'll kill everybody. Uh, You don't want to let them into heaven. (laughs) Without a transformation spiritually that takes place in the heart and in the soul and in the mind. Will we be surprised by some of the people we meet in heaven? Oh, yes, we will. Some of you have been surprised by some of the people you've met at this conference. Uh, (laughs) Is everybody going to go to heaven? No. C.S. Lewis said, No theory which regards divine punishment as essentially curative can finally be satisfactory. Only one that recognizes that punishment is deserved. Goes on to say, Judas did not sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. He sold himself for 30 pieces of silver. Fifty years ago, Leon Morris, the Anglican scholar from Australia, lectured at Cambridge on the whole issue of the love of God. And he said this, The God of love cannot treat the rejection of love as though it were not rejection. Otherwise, such love would be as unloving as it is unrighteous. He went on to say, you cannot isolate the love of God from the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, and the justice of God. You cannot treat the plain words of Jesus as if it is mere hyperbole. The rich man in hell lifts up his eyes in flames because Jesus gives you every indication that the flames are real. Rob argues, well, the term Gehenna was the garbage dump in Jerusalem. Therefore, Jesus was simply saying, don't waste your life. Don't end up in the garbage dump. No, Jesus was saying, hell is like the garbage dump. And just as the flames in the garbage dump never go out, the flames in hell will never go out as well. Dr. Falwell, who founded Liberty University was not a perfect man by any means, but he was bold, he was courageous, and he was never afraid to tell anybody what he thought they needed to hear. When he was on a talk show with Phil Donahue years ago, Donahue looked at him right in the face and said, are you telling me that if people are not born again through Jesus Christ, they're going to go to hell? He said, yes, absolutely. Then Donahue looked at him and said, are the flames real? And Jerry looked back at him and said, yes, and hot ones too. And he said, and even talk show hosts will end up there. Uh, The whole point, you don't build the world's largest Christian university by just fooling around with the message. You declare the message loud and clear and powerful. That's the bad news that we're facing. The good news is that God is still God, God is still on the throne, Jesus is still coming, and the hope of the church is as real as it ever was. The challenge for those of us in this organization is the time has come. We have got to reach out to the younger generation. 
If they were reaching out to us 20 years ago, we need to reach out to them. We need young scholars like Mark Hitchcock and Andy Woods. We need young preachers who declare the premillennial, pre-tribulational message. Guys like Mark uh, Hitchcock who does it in his church. Jack Hibbs in his church. Uh, I think of Daryl Skinner in Hawaii. And uh, I think of David Love in Denver and others of you that are teaching this message not just as a convenient thing to preach. You are studying it with great detail. You are into the text. You are concerned about the Bible. You're concerned about getting it right. And you're declaring it to the glory glory of God. And you need to pass it on to the next generation, to the 30-year-olds who seem to have lost their way in this culture. Uh, I work in an institution where 60-year-olds do the teaching and 30-year-olds are the administrators. It's awful. Uh, I got my office moved last year uh, because a 30-year-old said, I don't want to walk all the way around the building to get to the dean's office, so I'm putting you in the back so I can be in the front. I said, now let me get this straight. You're 30, and you don't want to walk. I'm 60, and I have to walk. Uh, But you know what? The truth is, that's better for me. You're going to be dead soon from not walking. Uh, (laughs) We need to challenge the younger generation. We need to challenge the African-American church. Don Perkins proclaims the message of the pre-tribulational promise of the coming of Christ, but he's one of few. There need to be hundreds like him who are willing to declare to the inner cities of America, to the black suburbs of America, to African Americans as well as Americans of every type, that Jesus saves, that the gospel is true, and the promise of the rapture is vital to the message of the New Testament. We need to reach out to the Hispanic community. We need to reach out to people beyond our comfort zone. People that are different than we are. For most of us, that means people that are younger than we are. Uh, People that are into technologies that we're not into. We have heard brilliant papers today and have had a technological nightmare uh, at the same time. We need a generation that knows how to communicate electronically. Because that's where they shut me off so he can get me. They desperately need to hear the message from us. Now, let me give you the good news. We still have the great assurance. Second Peter chapter 1. For we have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto we do well that we take heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in our hearts. We have a certain word of convincing people about the message of Christ. Uh, we heard from Paul this morning, a whole series or this afternoon of uh, quotes from great leaders of the past. Uh, who believed that the message of prophecy was tied to the heart of evangelism. They were passionate about it because they believed it was going to happen soon. If they were convinced of that, how much more should we be? I believe you can be so close to the trees, you can't see the forest. It can be right on top of you. Did you ever walk into a wall? Uh, walk into a mirror or a glass door, there it was, and boom, it hit you right in the face. Why? Because you didn't see the perspective as close as it really was. It has often been said if the great Bible prophecy teachers of the past were alive today and could read the newspaper, they'd be so excited they couldn't sleep. We are on the verge of seeing it come to pass. We need to preach it. We need to print it. We need to practice it. We need pastors and teachers and publishers that will proclaim this message uh, to the glory of God. When Dr. LaHaye started this organization 20 years ago, he was convinced the message was beginning to wane. It needed to be revitalized. And I would remind us, it needs to be revitalized again. We need to not rest on the laurels of what has happened in the past 20 years, but look ahead to what may need to happen in the next 20 years if the Lord should tarry. I would remind us also of the great prediction uh, in the meantime that Jesus gave us in Matthew 16. For I tell you that on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell or Hades will not prevail against it. He takes the disciples to Caesarea Philippi outside the borders of Israel. Takes them to a pagan city named for Caesar and for Herod Philip. Takes them to that 
unusual Gentile city to announce to Jewish disciples that I will establish my ecclesia uh, and this assembly uh, will not be overcome by the gates of hell. There where the source of the Jordan River bursts out of the rock. Ancient historians claim steam came out at that point and the Greeks thought that was the gates of Hades. Jesus takes the disciples to the gates of hell to say to them, the church will not be overcome by the gates of hell. You don't attack with gates. You defend with gates. Jesus pictures the church on the offensive, proclaiming the freedom of the message of the gospel. He sees Satan on the defensive, desperately holding on to his kingdom. And every time somebody is saved, you reach in and capture them out to the glory of God. You can argue all day long, whether it's electing grace or whether it's free will. I, I want to tell you one thing. The more people you preach it to, the more people you share it with, the more people God seems to elect. Uh, that is a quote right from James Kennedy, a Presbyterian, uh, a five-point Calvinist who founded Evangelism Explosion. Thirdly, I'd remind us, in the meantime, we have the commission uh, of the Great Commission, our marching orders, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Make disciples of all nations. Uh, we know what he wants to do, build the church in the church age, preach the message Fulfill the Great Commission, and as we do, the day will come when we will see the great promise fulfilled, the trumpet will sound, the archangel will shout, and we'll be called home to glory. Uh, Jesus' statement in John 14, And I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come back and take you with me, that where I am, there you may be also. He said that to the eleven believing disciples, Judas having left the room. Only to those 11 believers did he promise, if I go to the Father's house, I will return for you. The glimpse and the promise of the rapture message. That's the great promise. That's the blessed hope. That's the hope that drives us in our personal lives, that drives us in our evangelism, that drives us in the outreach of missions. And why is it that as the message of the coming of Christ is declined in society, evangelism declines, missions is declining, and the impact on the world is going backward instead of forward. It is a total package in the message of the Word of God, and it reminds us ultimately of the great triumph in Revelation 19, that one day after the rapture, after the judgment seat of Christ, after the marriage in heaven, we will return, and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness and justice he makes war, and his robe is splattered with blood, and on it is a name written that no one knows but he himself, the secret unspoken name of God, and yet declared on that robe the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Thirty times the book of Revelation uses the symbol of the Lamb to depict the person of Christ. It is the ultimate conflict between the Lamb and the beast. And the final chapter reminds us, in the end, we win. The Lamb will triumph over the beast. My wife reads occasionally, not often, Christian romance novels uh, and uh, left-behind novels. And she'd get into the left behind novels and she'd be wanting to know, is Chloe going to live or die or what's going to happen? And I, I confess I'm not much of a reader of novels. So I just flipped to the back page and I said, now she's still alive on the back page. So she at least <laughs> makes it to the next volume. <laughs> well, when it comes to the message of the Bible, we've all read the back of the book. And the answer is we win. So then let's live like it, let's think like it, let's act like it, let's preach like it, and let's teach like it to the glory of God. God bless you. Thank you.